Welcome back to Conversations with Great Minds. I'm speaking with Katrina Vanden Heuvel, the editor and publisher of The Nation magazine, as well as an influential member of the progressive community, I'd say the American community. Katrina, I'd like to talk a little bit about you, if that's okay with you. I'm, I'm curious, you've, sure. you've been um, uh, on and off with The Nation magazine since college, if, if, if the parts of your bio that I read are, are correct, and, and on for a long, long time since then. I'm curious what shaped your political views? At what point did you start thinking of yourself as a person who was politically aware and, and what brought that about? Uh, you know, so much of, I think, people's lives come from their family. My father uh, was in the Kennedy administration and the Justice Department. He helped, he helped integrate schools in Virginia. He ran for office in this city uh, for district attorney, for governor for Congress against John Lindsay in 1960. Wow. Uh, he didn't win, but in losing, you win. And he uh, managed Jimmy Carter's campaign. And he's been a force. He's re and he's been involved with the, uh, the legacy of Franklin Roosevelt, which has been such an inspiring force. And so interesting to see that legacy come back in important ways. So the interest in being involved in government and politics. And then my mother, a journalist, more literary, more radical spirit. And so those forces. And then I was involved in journalism in high school and in advocacy journalism in college. And I was an intern at The Nation, which in many ways formed my worldview at a fairly older, impressionable age. I was an intern, uh, as were some of the great journalists in America, as is the current member of the Labor Party in Britain, Edward Miliband, class of 1989. <laughs> um, and that, for me, has been an alternative America, an alternative sense of uh, the role journalism can play uh, in our history. Uh, and there have been some great moments in nation history, and we're planning in a few years out to celebrate the 150th, because uh, the nation is America's oldest continuously published weekly. But I'm very thrilled because I think in these last years I've brought on a younger cohort of journalists, so if I could just boast for one minute, mm -hmm. I think of the tradition of I.F. Stone. Uh, some of your viewers may have known of I.F. Stone. If not, go check him out. He was the Washington correspondent for a few years in the 30s and 40s. But in that tradition, our national affairs correspondent, Jeremy Scahill, who testified before the House Judiciary Committee just yesterday, Thursday, yesterday, on uh, WikiLeaks and national security. But I see in that spirit, that, that investigative, muckraking, uh, question all, question authority, truth, and um, speak truth to power tradition, something that I think has informed me and I will, you know, today in the New York Times, there's a story about the convictions of three policemen in New Orleans who, after Hurricane Katrina, in vigilante style, killed an African-American man, Henry Glover. The Times uh, doesn't usually do this, credited the nation for its reporting. And one reason I'm in journalism, Tom, and I think you are too, is not simply to speak our mind, but it's to expose injustice and try to bring some justice to those who are voiceless or marginalized in our country and our world. And that's what moves me and gets me up many mornings. In 1988, you were awarded New York University's Olive Branch Award for a special issue that you conceived and edited called, the, called Gorbachev's Soviet Union. And um, I noticed that there's a thread of, of the Soviet Union through your life, including your husband. Yeah. And I'm curious your thoughts about the significance of that work in 1988 that you did and, and that, that general thread. And what actually, uh, if you're familiar, I don't know if you're familiar with Dmitry Orlov's work, but you know, what lessons can the American empire learn from the collapse of the Soviet empire? Interesting, big question. I would simply say that in 1988, it was still not, it was, you know, wasn't in the mainstream by any means to consider the reforms in the Soviet Union, perestroika, glasnost under Mikhail Gorbachev, real reforms. And the nation with its special issue, and Steve, Stephen Cohen, my husband, in his columns in The Nation, under then editor Victor Navasky, in his columns, Sovieticus, he understood the possibility of reform in a system that so many considered totalitarian. And he was contrarian, and he sees things others didn't. So that issue is very much a result of Steve's work, and it won that award. But yeah, my life, I've been going since 1978. I continue to go. Uh, I'm friends with many journalists there, and I try to look at that country in a clear-eyed way. I think much of the coverage in this country is very simplistic. 
uh, and very focused again on the on Putin. I was just reading a piece by a journalist friend, Russian journalist friend, about some of the journalism around the country, print journalism, that is quite independent. Of course, state TV is our close friend Leonid Parfionov, in a very powerful speech in Moscow just about 10 days ago, took on state-controlled television. Mm -hmm. Lessons of the empire, well, I was sitting in Moscow in 1989 watching now regional Moscow governor Gromov, then general, lead the Red Army out of Afghanistan. And I think Mikhail Gorbachev came to power in 1985. It took him four years, but he said early on that he understood his country could not withstand the cost, the burden the, 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 of, of empire in Afghanistan. And I think that was part of what I learned from that experience. I think the question of the Soviet Union as an empire is a very difficult one. I think the question of the end of the Soviet Union is a difficult one because in some ways it was abolished. It could have been, it, it, it didn't collapse, but it was, it's a complicated story. But the main thing I would say is when I look at this Russia today, that fire sale looting in the 1990s under Boris Yeltsin and the creation of an oligarchy, a plutocracy, is something I think we as Americans need to look at and take lessons from because we confront the creation of our own American oligarchy and plutocracy and the very corruption of a system in this country that we want to be an ideal to the world. And my view has always been, Tom, and I'll, I'll stop, is we do best by ensuring that we are fulfilling the promise of our democracy and not intervening in other countries and not hectoring other countries and not lecturing under other countries when we have a lot to rebuild at home and not to be isolationist, but to focus on that first and to think of ways to engage in a world in far less militarized ways. We come upon the 50th anniversary of Eisenhower's military industrial complex speech, January 17th, I believe, 2011. And if General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower came back, he would, eyes rolling in his head if he looked at what was going on in this country. I think he, I, I agree. I think he would be genuinely horrified. In the three or so minutes left we, that we have here, I'd like to, to, to come back for a moment to, to uh, optics and strategy and politics. You're a, a clear-eyed observer of these things. Um, yesterday, the, the, uh, the, the, the big story that was going to drive the news cycle was that the Democrats had said no to Obama. And then somebody said to Harry Reid, blow up Susan Collins' negotiations on don't ask, don't tell, and hold a vote. And that, of course, captured the news cycle. Uh, today, the big story that was, was going to be coming out was the filibuster by, by Bernie Sanders. And then Bill Clinton gets brought into the White House and uh, hastily called news conference. And he goes on and on and on and on at some length and basically <laughs> blows Bernie off the headlines. I, this is pretty sophisticated manipulation of the media cycle against progressives. When has this White House done that against Republicans, and do you think that they might get the idea to do right. that in the future? Well, first of all, when President Obama gave his press conference, you know, why did he focus his anger on progressives, the much maligned base? Why not first on Republicans? But, you know, Tom, I kind of disagree because my sense is there are different news cycles in this country right now. Mm -hmm. There's so many points of entry. There's your program, your radio program. I think millions of people are in are enchanted, are watching Bernie Sanders. The nightly news, my, I read somewhere just as I was coming here that one of the nightly news programs, which a lot of people don't get their news from anymore, led with Bernie Sanders. Hmm. I think the White House woke up this, mor woke up this morning and there was, they were going to do Clinton. Yeah. But Bernie blew him off. And I think, you know, social media, Facebook, Twitter, email, people are really excited about Bernie Sanders because, again, it's a sense of life, resilience in this system, and it's not as stage managed. So I have, a little, I have a little hope, even in this corroded media system, uh, which needs a, you know, well, we need to fight for net neutrality, terrible word, but need to, to fight to keep things open. Yeah. And I think we also um, need to understand the power of WikiLeaks. That's a different discussion. But I think, you know, the fight to ferret out what elites, what government, what corporations don't want us to know is a big fight moving forward. In our, in so our I think tonight's in, Bernie's. Yeah, in our closing minute, one of the, one of the things that I've always uh, loved about the work that you do and, and the positions that you take is that they seem to have at their core optimism and hope about America and about small-d democracy. 
Can you just, for 60 seconds, riff on that? You know, it, it's very, I think, Tom, sometimes there's a sense on the left, progressive left, of looking at the underside I am not by nature an optimist, but I am hopeful. Not a rosy optimism, but a sense that there is work worth doing, work that we must do to fulfill the promise of our country. And, you know, I try to identify what I call sweet victories around this country and the world. I did that every week for a while. I'm going to continue to do it in 2011 because I think there's so many important things happening, good things that if people knew about, that there would be a sense of moving in a new direction. And it's rebuilding our politics, rebuilding our democracy um, through our media, through our organizing, through our work um, that, that keeps me going. And some of it's soul therapy. Uh, you know, some of it is to, you know, as you must, sometimes you can fall into a funk and say, it's not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna do it. There's a role for the powerful critique and a role for those who want to just expose. But I believe in exposing and proposing and bringing people a sense that uh, there is work worth doing. So very, very well said. Katrina Vandenhuvel, publisher and editor of The Nation. Nation, it's nation.org, thenation.org, right? Nation.com. Nation.com, thank you very much. Dot com, thank, thank you. you. Katrina, thanks for being with us.